So yeah, our first topic is going to be talking about kind of the design point of view. Um, what went wrong according to article from design and kind of sharing some of my experiences along with this. So, Do you want to queue us up for something? Yeah, yeah. I'll take care of that. You take care of the talking. All right. Um, so I think like one of the main, one of the main things, one of the main thesis of the, the article is that the design of the game really had no, uh, strong vision for the design, it was speci specifically for the design. Um, the, there was a lot of, um, kind of meandering, I mean, and, 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 and to, and to to be clear here, like you know, sometimes you need to meander a little bit for creative work. It's, you know, this is kind of the difficulty of creative work is that you don't necessarily have a you know a path laid out for yourself. You know, sometimes you're going off into new directions. Um, and the original the original um, the original design for Anthem sounds like you know they, they that's kind of what they wanted to do. That they they wanted to kind of do something new because they talked about the game kind of being a um, a survival type game. Um, you know, you'd basically be holed up in a city. You would um, uh, you'd be holed up in a city. You'd be uh, for you know making forays out into the wilderness and this hostile planet. Um, uh, and uh and and so a lot of the gameplay would be like you know how long can you survive um which i think uh, i think is potentially a very interesting type of game but you know like you know it looked like they, they kind of wanted to do something that you know like hadn't really been done very much before um and so you know again like you're gonna you kind of want to expect some uh, experimentation, trying to figure things out. I think the the one problem you run into though with this is that it, you know, it the experimentation became um, essentially too much. Uh, you know, went on too long, and, there, and nobody kind of like learned from the experimentation. There wasn't experimenting like, oh hey, this works. Let's go this direction. Let's do this thing. There, there that that that's the key word is there. There wasn't direction. Right, right, right. And like a lot of this kind of comes down to um, uh, how um, how management operates. Like you know, usually you know, I'll talk a bit about this later with when we talk about management. But you know, there's kind of two aspects of management. There's you know the authority and the responsibility. And it feels like you know, like maybe people are given authority, but there's no responsibility for um, kind of you know uh, keeping things on track. Um, and so, uh, and so basically, you know, the result of this basically an extended pre-production cycle. Um, pre-production cycle is basically when you, you know, where, where you're doing a lot of kind of the setup, the meandering, the, the concept, you know, working on the concepts. Um, and so, uh, you know, when, when basically when that, when the pre-production goes too long, um, Usually that means like you know you're either not finding something fun, which generally means you know for most projects means you're going to cancel it. Mm -hmm. The other the other the, or, or the other issue you know the other option is basically yeah you know you kind of like find some fun, and you kind of say okay well we're gonna we're gonna focus on this we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna continue working on this. And that's how some games go from being one project to another, kind of like um. Like that, that Atlas Pirate game started out as a uh, Ark mod, right? So they probably saw started as a mod, saw that the, there was a potential for something else, and then shifted right, it over right. to its own IP. Right, right. Kind of saw that it was, it was, you know, there was a lot, a lot more fun in it than just, oh, you know, here's something we're gonna, you know, shove out to maintain interest. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, and like I said, like, you know, a, a lot of times companies need to really stay flexible, um, cause you never know when, when, when you're going to see developments like that. Um, when you're going to see people kind of, um, when you're going to see a, a project kind of go, oh, like, Hey, this is like a lot more fun than we thought it was, or, or even the flip side, like, you know, 
um, I've said before, like one of the things that a lot of people don't realize, and this is kind of like one of the things I think a Kickstarter campaigns really kind of alerted people to, is there's a lot of games that get into pre-production that never see production. Mm -hmm. You know, like stuff that seems like a great idea. You know, like you can have you know concept art worked out and you know beginning design documents and whatnot, but eventually you start working on some prototypes. And you're like, oh well, this isn't going to work. <laughs> right? Uh, is it too soon to talk about the the uh, E3 stuff? Free anthem. Uh, yeah, I was gonna talk a little bit about uh, about that with marketing, cause you okay. know, uh, E three stuff. Uh, E three is basically a big marketing thing. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Um. So, uh. But yeah, like um, and I think that uh, one of the things that you know, one of the things you kind of uh, you know, what makes a good designer? Um, I think it kind of became a um became a, a huge issue in this game. Where, because um, a lot of times they talk about, well, you know, it's hard to find the fun when, you know, you weren't sure, when, you know, things weren't working, when, you know, things weren't finished. And, you know, I, but that's kind of like the, the, the steady state, really, to be honest, with a lot of games. You know, like a game's not going to be finished until it's done. And, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and, you know, it's, it, you know, a good designer is a type of person can look at something that's half finished. And go. Oh, I see what's going to be interesting about this. I can see what's going to be compelling about this. Having like that insight into right, right. the product. Right, right. Yeah, you know, because they understand other types of games, or they, you know, they have the imagination or vision or whatnot. Um, and again, like this is this is something you kind of rely. Yeah, you, know, you often rely on um, uh, management to have. This is not something you kind of like you know hire a junior programmer and expect them to be able to see a game. Uh, you know, the, it's, you know, see, see what makes the game fun all on their own, um, and so, uh, and then uh, like you know, and what separates the good designers from the great designers then is like you know, the the designers who can basically kind of like guide people in the direction of that, where they can kind of point out and say, oh well, you know, like here's what's fun, here's how we get there, here's the steps we need to do to take to get there, and kind of convince people to. Um, and convince people to basically kind of like, you know, to, to, to go in that direction. Um, and, and that can be pretty hard because, like, you know, like design tends to be kind of full of egos. Um, My design is better than your design. How dare you? Uh, Why? Well, I mean, like, <laughs> and, and like, you know, it's it's really hard to basically, you know, to, to be objective about design stuff. Like, you, you you know, it's it's hard to say. Oh, you know, like, you know, my, this this design that I'm proposing is objectively better than yours. My death was object objectively better than my life. I mean, um, but yeah, and and so, I I, I think that um. And so you, you kind of need, like, you, know, you have to, you know, you have to have some way to deal with the ego. The egos. Everybody kind of have their own, you know, great idea that they think is going to make or break a game. Um, and so, you know, I, like a lot of it, you know, either and there's different ways to do that. You can, you know, you can either have a very charismatic person, you can have a person that basically just, you know, holds a lot of authority uh, because they've done great things in the past. You just have, you know, or you know, you could potentially even have like, you know, just really good people that, you know, like. You know, want to cooperate, that want to kind of, you know, then this is the ideal situation, like, you know, having a bunch of people that want to cooperate, that want to make this a great experience, um, and they, you know, they kind of uh, respect and value, you know, what other people, what other people see in that. And theoretically, that uh, Bioware was one of those kind of studios. Right, right. I mean, you know, um, like, uh, the, you know, the, uh, there was an article a while back talking about Google uh, did a lot of like kind of internal research about what allows you know teams to kind of perform their best. Mm -hmm. And one of the things they talked about was that this concept of emotional security, where people feel like their ideas are being listened to and considered, um, and you know feel like they can kind of collaborate. Emotional security, right? You you skipped a little bit. Oh yeah, emotional security. Yeah, sorry. Okay, gotcha. My, my internet's been yeah, emotional security. Like you know, the idea where you can basically be able to contribute and uh, share freely without you know like worrying about being mocked. 
And, and, and this isn't to say, like, you know, people won't, you know, like, argue against your idea, but it's going to be more from a, you know, like, oh, you know, I have experience with this, or, you know, have you considered this angled type of thing? Um, or, you know, sometimes you just have, like, a really strong personality at the top, and somebody's going to, like, nope, we're going this direction. Um, which, uh, uh, you know, like, uh, that tends to be a little riskier, because, like, you know, if, if if people kind of, like, if you have that really charismatic type of person, and they're going in completely the wrong direction, well, you know, it can be really hard for you to kind of say, um, actually. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's important to have that objective final voice. Right, right. Or even if not objective, like just someone that has authority, either whether it's granted authority or, you know, earned authority or whatever. Um, that can just push the direction and keep right, everything right. going. Right, right. Like someone who can basically, like, it's yeah, basically it's kind of a twofold thing. Somebody that has the, 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 the imagination and ability to see the direction you need to go, and then the person that basically can convince others that, you know, this is the way we need to go. And, um, and you know, like, that person, you know, the, the, called the keeper of the vision in, in a lot of circles, um, is someone that, you, you know, you want to have, and make sure that they're kind of, like, pushing, cheerleading, you know, doing whatever they need to do in order to get people going that direction. It sounds like that's one of the big things that Anthem kind of was missing, was they really didn't have that person that said, we're going to go this direction. I think I think you know part of the part of the problem or the, part of the reason for that though is that you know because um, from the sounds of the article like you know like um, they people wanted to do some things that Bioware wasn't very good at basically <laughs> um, they talked about like you know like the when the story you know when the story writers coming in and you know everybody being like well this story is very Dragon Age and it not, not being a very complimentary thing. And so you kind of have this conflict between kind of like doing what, what you know works and what a company is good at um, uh, as opposed to like doing something that's actually kind of interesting rather than just kind of rehashing the same thing over and over again. Mm -hmm. um, and and, and it, it, it's, it's a bit of a tricky thing because like, you know, uh, sometimes people can be, um, so, you know, sometimes, you know, uh, you know, if, if you... If you want to go work at Bioware, you probably want to go work at Bioware because they do top-notch RPGs. Um, but the flip side of that is, like, if you've been working on top-notch RPGs for a decade, you might want to do something else and, like, you know, and basically just kind of pulling up roots and and moving to another company uh, can be, you know, can be personally very risky. Um, so yeah, I think you know, like, you, you want to try to find a good balance there. I think like one of the that was one of the problems that. Um, that they ran into is like you said they brought in the story person who was basically writing a bioware type rpg you know story and you know like everybody wanted to do something different something that wasn't just another bioware rpg story uh but the but the, the writer's like uh but i why is that a bad thing <laughs> well and if i remember from the article it sounded like that was also his guidance from the right, right. leadership as well. Right. I, I, I guess this is kind of like a supplementary topic for talking about um, design direction and whatnot. Like, if you have, if you generally you have like one person who's kind of considered the keeper of the the, the, the the vision. The reason why you want one person doing that is because yeah, you want to avoid situations like that where one person says, "Oh, we're going to do X," and somebody else is like, "No, no, let's do Y." Yeah, you because know, you don't you don't want necessarily that dissent in the um, in the ranks. You don't want that confusion. You don't want one person saying we're going to do this, and another per you know the other person saying no, no, we're going to go in this completely different direction. Especially if those two things you know are, are you know basically work at you know, cross purposes. Mm -hmm. Miscommunication in in creative work. <laughs> the hell are you say? Oh my goodness, I've never. I never thought. Right. <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, so you don't want, you know, like, yeah, in this, in this specific case, it sounds like, you know, yeah, the, 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 the guy who was writing the story was basically told, oh, you know, do your usual thing. Whereas everybody else in the team's like, uh, but this was supposed to be not the usual thing. 
life support incoming. Um, that one guy's the most hated person in the world. <laughs> well, I mean, again, like, you know, in some ways, it, it makes sense that if you have expert storytellers that are telling a very popular type of story, why wouldn't you use them? Mm -hmm. um, you know, like, a, a game company trying to do something they're not known for, um, you know, it is... There's, you know, uh, you know, it might be better for like some other type of company to do it. Like, you know, I, you know, uh, for like example, that's, like, that's like a Blizzard type move, right? Or, or like, I, I get, you know, like a good example. Of this is like, you know, like, you know, if you want to talk about loose shooters, you know, we're playing Warframe, mm -hmm. which is done by Digital Extremes, which was basically like a nobody company that basically, you know, had done a couple games, decided to do kind of this really, you know, they weren't really known for doing anything particular. Um, and so they basically kind of decided to do, you know, what was, you know, for them a rather audacious, you know, a game. That should keep you going for a while. And so, uh... And it's even mentioned in the article that we're talking about. Right, right. Because <laughs> it's kind of another, considered another type of loot shooter, which is the general genre that, um, that, uh, Anthem fits into. But don't compare it to Destiny. <laughs> Well, I mean, that's, yeah, that's, that's one of the things that we tie, you know, that's another kind of issue is that, you know, once the design shifted, um, there was basically kind of like a conflict between kind of like understanding the uh, design had shifted and kind of like, because, you know, in the article they said that, you know, like destiny became a, a forbidden word. Like you couldn't talk about destiny because they didn't want the comparisons with it, even though it basically it turned, you know, it's, you know I've, I've not played either Anthem or Destiny, so, you know, like, but, you know, just kind of from what I've heard from other people, like, they're very similar type of games. Yeah. And, like, you know, if, if you're not playing your competitors' type games to understand what they're doing right and wrong, then basically you're kind of hobbling yourself. Yeah, um, a good example of that done well is, uh, Paladins by hi Uh, that, uh, yeah, it was hi that did Paladins, right? Yeah, yep. Um, they, they started with, um, Global Agenda, which was kind of a co-op PvP, mm. PvP game. Um, but then they started doing Paladins and then, uh, uh, Blizzard started doing Overwatch and mm. then they saw what Blizzard did right with Overwatch. They're like, oh yeah, we could use that. Right. And then, and they admitted it and then Blizzard admitted that they used some of their stuff some of their right. ideas came off of Paladins, so it was kind of a, a right. two-way street. Right, exactly. And, 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 I mean, you can be damn sure that basically, you know, like, um, you know, the, the, you know, the Destiny team is looking at, um, is, is looking at basically, uh, you know, what Anthem is doing right and wrong to try to avoid that type of thing. Um. Yeah, I, I played a little bit of Destiny 2. And mm. when I was watching footage of Anthem, I'm like, without knowing anything about Anthem, I, I knew I, I knew nothing about Anthem. Right. I saw the footage from it, I'm like, oh, it's like Destiny. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> like, and, 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 yeah, I mean, I, I, again, I think this is kind of like where you get a kind of a conflict of vision where some people still saw the game as like, oh, we're going to do something new and different. And other people are like, but it's morphing into this other thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and like, you know, but nobody, no, nobody had the, you know, the ability or the authority or whatever to basically kind of step in and say, um, no, actually, you know, like this, this is the direction we're going. So you had kind of people, you know, one group thinking, oh, we're, we're doing a loot shooter. Why aren't we playing Destiny? Other people going, well, we're not doing a loot shooter. So, you know, we don't want to move toward Destiny. I just got hey kiddoed. Oh. <laughs> Anyways. Oh. And I, I think that was like one of the big flaws because the attitude they take. Oh, don't, don't. We don't talk about Destiny. Refer to Diablo three. Well, it, you know, if you hear hooves and what is the saying? You hear hooves in City Park. Don't expect a zebra. Like right. Like just because you don't call it that doesn't mean it's not that. <laughs> right, right. I mean, like there's a little bit of like kind of facing reality type thing here. Where you know, like you know, people um, understanding it, yeah, exactly. Like you know, understanding what you're making, 
and 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 kind of realize. I mean, like you know, we kind of you know, a lot of people kind of poo poo, you know, like the idea of clones or whatnot of existing popular games. But the reality is, though, you know, that that's that's kind of how games were made. You know. Yeah, look at Fortnite. Fortnite was seen as a, a clone of PUBG. Right, right. And it skyrocketed in popularity. Well, I mean, or like look at World of Warcraft. Like in World of Warcraft, <laughs> it, it, you know, it's built on, you know, it's basically built like a lot of other, you know, MMOs. World of Warcraft yeah. with the original, you can't. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. It says the person ignorant of history. Yes. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it, you, you do have this kind of like uh, um, idea of um you know taking something and doing it better or putting your own spin on it or whatever or something like that um Our position has been compromised defend the cargo until reinforcements arrive um so yeah you you kind of want to i think you know you kind of want to just be honest with yourself and kind of like you know uh no you know basically the extension know what type of game you're making and whether or not you want flying in it I mean, oh yeah, I mean, that's, that's, uh, you know, that's another interesting thing is like, you know, understanding you know, if something is a core element or not, like, you know, um, and sometimes like you really kind of, like, again, this is, this is where something like things would have been better if somebody hadn't just made a firm decision and said, yes, we're having flying or no, we're not having flying. Because if you have the kind of this on again, off again situation where, yeah, like, you know, um, you get basically essentially what you know exactly what happened with anthem where you know they you know they would put flying in and it was frustrating and it wasn't working out so they would take it out but then they were realizing well you know without flying we're kind of missing something so they put it back in and then yeah yeah like you know you just kind of get in this vicious cycle where you would never um Essentially, you would never, you know, like you, you, they never, you know, had the chance to kind of focus on improving flying to make it, you know, make it the great thing that, you know, it eventually did become. Like eventually, you know, uh, you know, they, they, you know, a decision was made. Yes, we're gonna have flying, and so that encouraged people to work on it and kind of understand it, and and I think even kind of like put, put the game, you know, put that in the context of the game to understand that like, oh well, we're gonna have flying. So like, you know, it, there's a lot of kind of like I said, there's a lot of consequences of that. Uh, of, of you know of having flying in the game. Yeah, uh, a, another example of like having issues with core elements is Warframe. For has an example of that with Arcwing. Like mm. the developers wanted to make it, or I, at least I got the feeling that Digital Extremes wanted to make it a core feature, mm. but they just never figured out how to make it fit properly it it all it always feels clunky and out of place and nobody really likes it so it kind of they they made it more peripheral right and shied away from actually imp uh, forcing people to use it more than they need to right right and it, and that i mean that type of thing too is like where you get like you know that's probably that's a good example kind of the op the, the flip side of it like where Anthem needed flying in order to, you know, have uh, something that set it apart from everything else. Whereas, you know, like um, Arcwing in, in, in uh, Warframe feels kind of like, a, hey, um, we can do this, I guess. Okay, let's see how well it works. Right. And, you know, and, and it's one of those things that, you know, once you invest a lot into such a system, you kind of want people to use it. But, you know, if it's just not it was just not an interesting part of gameplay. I, like, you know, and, and like, I think that, um, I mean, we've talked about this before. I think one of the things with um, Warframe is that the movement is fun. And then, and, and just in Arcwing, the movement is so different that it makes it, you know, it makes it harder for it to kind of feel like a core element of it. Um, but yeah, but I mean, like, it, but you, like, you know, uh, there's this kind of this uh, uh, term that you know designers use called knifing our babies, which is like you know the kind of the realization that sometimes your brilliant idea isn't gonna work. So sometimes you gotta you know cut your losses. And even if you even if you really you know feel like very strongly about this feature, sometimes you gotta ditch it. And I'm probably kind of the, the best. Oh, I'm getting invaded. I'm a waste and must be erased. Says the robot. Oops. Wow. Oh, 
Oh my god. I, I can pull them out of the Nidus' larva with my oh, tornado. Yeah. We were uh, we were fighting over I, crowd control. Oh yeah, yeah, I saw that. Oh, I saw that. Because when I was doing that, that's hilarious. Oh my but god, yeah. that's funny. So like, like I said, like, you know, sometimes you just kind of like need to know when they cut. And again, like this is this is generally something like you you want the experienced people to do. I mean, there should have been experienced designers, managers, producers, you know, directors, you know, whatever whatever the company is going to call them, that you know should have made these types of calls and say, oh, we're not, you know, like this is not working, or this is working, or we need to do this thing, or we're going to ignore this thing now. Um. But nobody did. Like it's not like you know that again. That, you know, it's kind of that, that lack of direction and vision. Um, I, the other thing I, I kind of look at is like you know basically like it feels like they were trying trying to do the wrong genre of game. Because mm -hmm. I mean, Bioware is kind of known for having these kind of grand story games, and it feels like you know some of the recent you know the the recent games they kind of like you know um, a couple of the recent games have, like probably haven't been appropriate for that. I think like the two examples that come to mind is you know besides Anthem, uh, is also uh, you know Knights of the Old Republic or you know, um, Star Wars: The Old Republic specifically. Knights of the Old Republic, you know, being single player game, I think it's, it did well with the story. But you know, Star Wars: The Old Republic, the MMO, like you know, they mentioned this in the article, like it's really hard to tell this great story when people are yelling at you, "Come on, come on, come on!" Um, like you know, we saw this in Final Fantasy XIV with the MSQ roulette. Where you know the 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 Square Enix decided to make the cutscenes unskippable because what would happen to people who in who went and ran some of the main story quests you know raids the first time they would essentially get completely left behind um, as, as, as everybody who had already done this basically just kind of rushed ahead and so your first you know your first trip through the dungeon was you know either you skip the story to watch it later or uh, or, or if you wanted to watch the cutscenes, you basically just got kind of, you know, you watch the cutscene, you got bumped to the next boss, you watch the cutscene, you got bumped to the next boss, because people were basically uh, running forward. Um, and so, and so sometimes, you know, having a multiplayer experience like that uh, is not the best place to tell, uh, you know, to try to tell a, like a, a grand story. I think that's maybe one of the problems with Anthem is that, you know, like if it hadn't been done by Bioware, there might have been a lot less focus on. You know, trying to tell this you know epic story in the context of the game, um, and so yeah, and I, I talked about it before in my blog talking about the idea of kind of player stories versus developer stories. Um, developer stories are kind of being the ones that basically developers write and put dialogue in the game and whatnot, and player stories are the ones that basically like you know like you know our player story right now is like hey remember that time we were you know defending. We played the nightmare mission, and we were defending the uh, um, defending the objective, and then something interesting happens. Um, we're playing warfare; nothing interesting ever happens. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I mean, but I mean, like when something interesting does happen, that becomes a lot more, you know, interesting story. Right. I mean, like, you know, and, uh, you can even look at like you know, for, if you want a, a more interesting example, is like a look at RP. You know, I'm sure you have you know a lot more interesting stories to tell about you know your makote tribe and things like that than what you know what square enix puts into the game only when i go to only when i go to the quicksands oh my god nobody goes to the quicksands um everybody goes to the quicksands just nobody, nobody worth talking to i think like you know i, I think the, the another problem you run into with this is like you know basically kind of like damages the social fabric when you don't have, when you basically you, you try to kind of tear people apart into individual instances to tell a coherent story, instead of like you know trying to kind of do a more environmental storytelling and letting people kind of experience the you know experience the story uh, together with friends. And it's, I think like you know, go ahead. Sorry, I was just uh, gonna say it's. Oh, <laughs> uh, we're off sync. Um, right. People love environmental storytelling. Just look at how many people, you know, lo you know, go crazy over like the Dark Souls story. Right, right, exactly. I think that like that type of thing is, you know, works a lot better for you know, an MMOs than basically having kind of this, you know, 
this single thread epic story, which you know, like again, like you know, th th you know, to be fair, this is what uh, Bioware is known for, but you know, it, it may not be appropriate for a loot shooter or an MMO or whatever. I think the last thing, you know, like the, the last major topic about this is um, talking about um, design resources. Like when you do things, like they talked about performance capture, which you know I think I think is what in the olden days we used to call you know motion capture, um, and you know like fully voiced lines. These are really great things that add to the immersion, that make things you know feel a lot more uh, interesting. But the flip side of that is like it makes things a lot less flexible, and like especially when you're talking about an online game as a service, like that flexibility is important. I remember you know like. A friend of mine that did work on uh, the Old Republic talked about how frustrating it was when, you know, like there was, you know, like they got all these these uh, these lines for the story voiced, and they were like, oh, well, this doesn't work in gameplay terms. Uh, but then, you know, their hands were tied; they couldn't just say, oh, oh, that's that's fine. We'll just redo, you know, we'll just redo the lines. Like, no, like you know, that's that's exp you know, you're not throwing away. You don't want to throw away money already spent uh and you don't want to you know have to spend more money to redo you know some some minor variation and he said that happened a lot with anthem where you know like the the voice you know the voicing was you know sometimes just doesn't make sense because you know, all that that's what they were stuck with they changed things but i think that's where 14 gets a little more leeway because if they have a cutscene that has voiceover that's you know doesn't work out story-wise or something in the story gets changed afterwards and they have to change that they can just cut the voice acting and turn it into a you know a dialogue only cutscene right 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 and i think that happened a lot in the realm we're born to be honest because there's some cutscenes in there that look like they're supposed to be voiceovered but they're not yeah. but they're not yeah so, I mean, that's kind of like a, a overview of kind of the design, you know, what kind of, you know, uh, tearing apart the article to see what, what went wrong with the design.